I go to a new place, uh, I really like history, so I spend a lot of time kind of getting to know what happened here and who was here and all those things, right? So now every time that I drive down the Bear River Valley, three or four times a week, um, I imagine Father Desmet not driving, but riding his mule or his horse, whatever he had at the time, down the valley. And probably a lot more difficult drive than I have because now I even have Fish Creek Pass, which no one had before that either, right? So um, it's a little better than it used to be, a lot better than it used to be. So I'll read a couple quotes about that. And so, it, but knowing one's history is always helpful, you know, like who was there, the priest before you, and um, learning all these different priests that did a lot of work to build the churches that we had and all those things. Um, I always look at the baptismal registry, and you go back to the oldest one you can find, so Montpelier, 1890, or 86, or 95, no, 70, I think I forgot it already, anyway, 88, that's what it was, 1888, Mrs. Fitzpatrick, who moved to Ogden, got married there, and who knows what happened after that, so, um, but that was the first one recorded, and that was when the priest was coming from Shoshone to go out to Montpelier, so, um, they could do a pretty good job. They could have all these records on a horse. Well, priests before me couldn't even write them down on a book when they're driving around in a car. So, but nevertheless, so history is, big, is a very important part. I think if we understand, especially our Catholic history, that might be helpful. I don't want this to be a history lesson either because I think we have to be engaging with contemporary culture or as I think we will find is a, a contemporary deep culture as, uh, the efforts of the missionaries to the Indians in the Northwest is kind of being put down now. We have this cancel culture. Most people heard about the Hinebra Acera statues over in California that being torn down. Well, the Smith himself was being torn down too, but actually in 2015, the, the university that he helped build and kept alive took his statue and put it in the back corner of the museum because people didn't like looking at him showing the crucifix to Indians who were humbly adoring that beautiful image of the crucifix. So we got to engage with that too. And the whole question of evangelizing indigenous cultures. I just came up from New Mexico uh, this last week. I took five days down there visiting a priest friend who's the first non-Franciscan, the first secular priest serving these uh, little reservations and pueblos in outside of San, outside of Albuquerque, just north of Albuquerque, the Jemez Pueblo, the Zia Pueblo, and Santa Ana Pueblo. And so I saw churches that no other white man has seen outside of Franciscan priests as well since 1700. Um, and um, churches and people that still speak their language but have this great reverence for their Catholic faith still. That they, that they keep their 1700 year old Adobe church and don't put pews in it and don't change the beautiful images that were painted there um, many centuries ago. So it's a, it's a good thing to, to uh, dialogue with as we pass through the life of this man. So Father Desmet, right? Um, I don't know when he was born. I didn't write it down. It's probably not that important. But um, 1801 probably, I guess. That's what this book shows me here. And he died in 1873. Um, but I just want to give it. So I'll give you a, a sketch of his, of his life and what he did in his missionary journeys. And then... A uh, little uh, analysis of what he thought about of bringing the, the Christian faith to the Indians, and and then end with oh, I'm finish that and end with just his character and he himself, right? So and, and his his character as his virtue, his weaknesses as a Catholic missionary, right? So Father Desmet, right, 1801, born in Belgium. Uh, kind of a middle class, well to do, uh, somewhat better, well to do family. Uh, I might be confusing this with other people I've read about recently, but anyway. So, his childhood, one thing I noted when I read about his childhood, so this comes from one of his biographies by a Father Lavelle, written in like 1830 something. So, uh, he was known for his agility and physical strength such that we called him Samson. That's Samson from the Bible. Now Samson and Delilah, Delilah fighting the Philistines. But I think that's a very big, uh, that's a very big important thing to note about his character is he was a strong, very viral man and because he needed that virility 
to really survive out here in the missions, um, which are much colder than Belgium. Um, and as reading just finished last week, Death Comes to the Archbishop or For the Archbishop by Willa Cather. It's a novel and it's historical, but uh, not totally accurate, but uh, one of the, the, the main priests there that went to Santa Fe, um, he was not a well, a well priest and that suffered a lot because he always got sick. And all these saints who weren't well, like Damien and Molokai, who just celebrated his feast day, you know, he was a very sickly person, um, but still he was able to serve in the missions even with that. But this is something that set this man aside is he was a very strong person. And he even talks about in his letters that sometimes he couldn't sit like the Indians because of his um, corporulence. That is, because he was large and maybe a little more round at times. Um, but then another day, he had another time he had fast for 30 days when he was going through the wildernesses north of Idaho from Saskatchewan into the Canoe River and down Okanagan into the Columbia um, because he couldn't um, couldn't get over the snow or down the river because he was too heavy to go fast for 30 days so that his boat would carry him down the river. So um, there's these things you gotta do, you know, you just gotta take a 30 day break and go do the 30 day spiritual exercises while you wait for the river to thaw out so you can ride the boat. He was also, um, so when he was called to, to serve, you know, so other missionaries came back from America. There was uh, a special man who was serving in Kentucky later to become the bishop of somewhere in New Orleans. And so this guy came back to his homeland in Belgium and he's talking to all the seminarians and all the young men. And that is when he had the real desire then to go to America too and become a great missionary. And something to note, it's always good like the Bible says, to to follow me, you must leave beside mother, father, and sister. And get take that all away and follow me alone, right? And so very much same for the missionaries, right? And they actually say, he says here, so he was called to serve the mission as a Jesuit. Um, he didn't tell his family until he got on the boat and wrote a letter and sent a letter from the boat. Uh, because he said, to have asked the consent of our parents would have been to court a certain and absolute refusal. Um, so you know, that's, it's a tough thing you know, to leave his home and his family and his father. One of the last letters before he died, there was an indication that he was a little more happy finally with with Pierre for leaving home like that. So he got to America, the first mission was somewhere in the East Coast, that didn't work out, not enough money, not enough land. So they got they moved to St. Louis, and there in the, the area of St. Louis is where they built their, their novitiate for the Jesuits. And when he was in the novitiate, so they're building all this stuff brand new, and they noted that they noted that he was very skillful and had Herculean strength and able to do the work of three men, the work of Samson, an architect and a builder. But not only that, he was a scientist, he was a geologist, a botanist, he spent time collecting minerals, plants, insects, and sending these specimens to benefactors or friends back home, because he's finding things that they don't have in Belgium, and he's uh, cataloging and taking, uh, taking note of all these things. And I even when you read about it and read his letters, when he passes through the Bear River Valley, people say, oh, look at all the beaver dams on the, on the Port Neuf River. And he says, well, those aren't beaver dams. That's, that's, that's lava flow. Um, there's no beavers at all. This is rock. And the lava came and it flowed down there and it flowed down there. And you look at the Port Neuf River, that's what it does. It goes so far and drops down. And he's a geologist. He knew what he's doing. And that's a good thing. Uh, so Jesuits were well-educated, right? And um, they knew not just the faith, but they, they were educated in science and, and things of that sort. His priesthood, right? So after his time of uh, scholasticism and, and as a novitiate, he entered into the priesthood. And the words of his final uh, master, or you know, like uh, the third, uh, the third, the third year master in the Jesuit program, his superior, he preached to the young men about what they're about to do. Right? They're preparing themselves to be missionaries, not to live in the cities, but to go out and especially dedicate themselves to the Indian peoples. And so he, probably, he was really encouraging them and just never reflects back on his words, the words that never left him from the Father Ben Quickenborn, his superior at the time. Principles of self-abnegation, that is, that is complete, humble, and giving of oneself to, to, to what you work and penance and sacrifice, the love of Christ, and, uh, and sincere apostolic zeal to proclaim the gospel at all times. And so he wrote, a, he wrote about Father Quickenburn saying, the salvation of souls was the one thought, desire, and longing of his life. 
He communicated his devouring zeal to, to other and to one another and felt carried away but we felt carried away by his words. Those who could not materially aid him in his work were, were moved to pray for his success. So as young priests, this was a very good a man who really spent much time in the missions trying to teach other missionaries what to do. And like so the main the main work that Father Desmond did was towards the missions, um, towards the Indian peoples. And so uh, because the the sense of this is um, a majority of Indian peoples wanted the Catholic missionaries and so they, they he writes in a letter that they notes there's a difference between the Protestant missionaries and the Catholic missionaries. And he says, what had they to do, asked the, the Indians were asking, what had they to do with merry preachers, men who wore no crucifix and said no rosary? They wanted only the black robes to teach, the how, teach them how to serve God. They even went so far as to appeal to the President of the United States asking that the married ministers be recalled and the Catholic priests be sent in their place. And we'll kind of talk about the, 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 the different movements between Protestant and Catholic missionaries over here in the Oregon country when we get to that point. So his first mission was the Pau to the Patawatami Mission in Council Bluffs, Iowa, so just across the Missouri from Omaha, Nebraska, but long before Omaha, Nebraska existed because St. Louis was the only town. So he went down there, the first Indian mission, um, and right away he was very well known as something that he's, he's known for the rest of his life as a minister of peace and reconciliation among the Indians. Um, right when he was with the Palakowis, they went out to the Sioux country, because the Sioux were trying to basically uh, massacre all of the Palatomi Indians. So he went out to the Sioux country by himself, and he brokered peace between them and the Patawatamis. Um, alone and unarmed, he was received by the Sioux, and they agreed to bury the hatchet, so they say. and so. Um, but then it didn't work either. He came back in 1842 and had it do it all over again because they broke the treaty. But uh, not only that, but this is constant, a constant working for peace and reconciliation. Especially in his latter life, he's very much involved in treaties between the U.S. government and different Indian peoples, particularly with the Sioux and Chief Sitting Bull and that final, the final treaty. He was a major helper um, since he was respected by the Sioux Indians, the one, one of the few Christians respected by the Sioux Indians as they weren't all that um, into the converting to the Christian faith. Um, another thing he noted that he would face, especially in the more the eastern side of the Indian peoples, because these are the ones that already have contact with, with the white race coming in and settlers and things of that sort, was uh, the issue of drunkenness and something that we usually often, that's a kind of a, um, where that word is, that thing, that, that stereotypical thing for an Indian, a drunken Indian. I actually just heard that in New Mexico this, this, uh, when I was down there last week. Um, but it, it is, truly was a problem, and but I like what he said here in his phrase, because uh, the idea is so that the government was paying the Indians about $50,000 of gold every year for five years to make up for moving them to a new land, and uh, then that was being taken advantage of, so people would come in and sell them all the things they aren't supposed to have, like liquor and stuff. So. But anyway, he says, what, what could one do with 2,000 drunken Indians? Where would it end? Who can say? For with the yearly arrival of the money, the same scene was enacted. The arrival of money and then um, purchasing things that they shouldn't be doing. So that's kind of his uh, first taste of his Indian mission work. So why did he come out to the Rocky Mountains, right? Why is he called the Apostles of the Rockies? Well, because there were uh, uh, quite a few tribes in this area that wanted Christian wanted Christianity. They wanted missionaries to come to them. And most of those are the ones we know on this side of the Rocky Mountains, and those, those especially those in Idaho, like the Shoshone here and the, and, the, and the Bannock. Not so much that region, but a little further north, you'd have the upper Nespers out in the Salmon region, and the town of Salmon, and then the lower Nespers, which is where I grew up down in that way in Lewiston, and then um, up above that, the Coeur d'Alene's and the Ponderays and the Callus Bells and the Spokans. So these, these, these bunches of tribes were, were open to Christian missionaries. But the first and foremost were the Flathead Indians, right? That would be the Bitterroot Valley is where they ended up settling after embracing Christianity. And why were they wanting missionaries when they didn't have any knowledge of Christianity already? Well, because they did have the knowledge of Christianity already. How did that happen? Well, some people say, 
Um, there's an old legend among the Cortland uh, tribe that in 1740, Chief Circling Raven of the Cortlands had a vision of the coming of the black robes. And so they were waiting for these black robes, what I mean by black robes, priests wearing the Roman classic style clothing, which I use all the time, but um, it's too hot right now. Um, and then, and then also other things that happened. So when Lewis and Clark came in 1805, right, they encountered the Flathead Indians and the Nespers Indians in particular ways as they crossed over the Bedroom Mountains into the, into the Snake River Valley and the Columbia River Valley. And they noted that, okay, they weren't maybe doing Christian things, but they were very virtuous, they said, in relation to the other Indians they passed through, like the Sioux and the Blackfoot Indians. As soon as they got to these other tribes, they found that they were far more virtuous than other Indians. And the, 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 the journals of, of, of Clark say that he found that they had no problems with chastity. And, and interestingly enough, often they did not practice polygamy, as most other Indian tribes had practiced polygamy. Uh, not so much polygamy, the fact that I'm tired of this wife, let's get another one. And so uh, not multiple ones very often. And so you know that they already have these virtues part of them. And we got, well, why is that the case? Uh, why is it that these few tribes in relation to other tribes, and I find this a correlation to maybe to even the tribes that Pueblo Indians was with down in, in, in New Mexico, is they were more of, a, more of a permanent people, more of a stable people, less nomadic lifestyle, which kind of brought about this better stability that brings about the want to have a home and want to have a consistent home and always continuing with that home. So I think that that's been often been judged as one of the one of the early indicators for that sort of for that sort of um, lifestyle that those Indians had had presented. And then we also saw in the early 1800s, right after uh, about the same time, and after Lewis and Clark came from America, we had French Canada sending down a lot of fur trappers, and they're all Catholic, right? And so as they become to know the Indians and their trade and their work, right? We have the famous Pierre's Hole, right up here in in um, Driggs or the Green River Rendezvous just across the divide in, in Wyoming. These were famous places where the trappers and the Indians were, would, would interchange and, 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 and do their spying and selling of goods. And they, of course, the French Indians, the French trappers would have brought their faith and, and little notes of that faith as well. But above all, the first thing that we, they really recognize is um, unbeknownst of the earliest Jesuit missionaries in America, people like Isaac Jogue and Jean de la Ruth and Jean Lalande and the other five guys, um, Rene Gruppel, and I just know them all. Um, I don't have a school anymore, so I don't talk about these things. Um, but um, yeah, the seven Jesuit martyrs and all the other ones that were with them. Unbeknownst to them, that 42 years after the, after the basic founding of, of American civilization, their hard work among the, the Indians of the Northeast and Canada, like the Iroquois Indians, really paid off because those Iroquois became very zealous Catholics, well-educated. They became fur trappers as well and ended up marrying into the Flathead Indian the tribes and brought the faith to the Flathead Indians from the beginning. So that's clearly where they got the faith. And there's even the, a great story, not so great, but um, Parker, one of the first Presbyterian um, missionaries in 1834 or five, when he came, he was actually in the Lapway region with the Nest person. He found that they were building crosses on their graves. And he says, well, these people never have encountered Christianity. Why do they have a cross over top of their grave? Um, and But that was because they had relationships with the Flathead and the Cordine Indians who had already received little tastes of Christianity. So he learned when we bury your dead, you could put a cross over top of them. Well, Parker, not liking Catholic um, iconography, broke the cross and threw it away and told them that's not how we do it. Christians put stones on their graves, one at the head, one at the foot. Um, so the very uh, icon iconoclasm, what he thought it was, was stamped out in 787, I see it too, but clearly it wasn't. Um, so uh, that's just a little, a little side there on the park of the Presbyterian. So then, um, after that, where are we going here? So we have the French fur trappers and the, the, the flathead fur trappers, or the Iroquois fur, fur trappers. And the famous guy's name was Ignatius. You'll hear about him if you read anything about Father DeSmet. He was one of the first guys that went to St. Louis asking for the black robes. And his son, young Ignatius, after him, did the same. 
It ends end with me, young Ignatius and Iroquois by by fifth generation um, was the one who went back to the, the Bitterroot Valley with Father Dismet for the first time. Protestant, uh, so then 1831 is when the first set the first time the the black the the Flathead Indians sent a deputation of Indians to St. Louis asking for missionaries. And so the missionaries weren't very established yet, not a lot of missionaries, not enough workers in the vineyard, so they couldn't send out right away, but they said, we will as soon as we can, we will. They heard about, in 1834 and 35, there's word down the street that missionaries were coming, so going to the rendezvous at the Green River and in Wyoming, the Flatheads and some Nespers went there, and there were some missionaries, but they noticed that they were married, and that they didn't have the black gowns and they didn't have the crosses. Um, so the Plaheads did not take them up to their places, but they did go over with the Nespers. Eventually, then the, the, those Presbyterian missionaries went to Western Oregon, what is now there in Oregon City, uh, where they founded their first church. And later on, we have people like the Whitmans, who went to Walla Walla, and the Spaldings down in Lapway. Um, and if you know the history very well, the Whitmans ended up being massacred later on, and then the Spaldings left right after that as well. Um, so then finally, we have the second deputy. So there's four times they send out Indians to St. Louis asking for missionaries. The second one, 1835. The third one, 1837. No one made it because they all died. And finally, the fourth one in 1839. In fact, they actually went through Council Bluffs and talked to Dismet on their way to St. Louis. And about that same time, Father Dismet was called back to St. Louis. I guess he was going up there for supplies, if I remember right. And um, then he was assigned to go to go to the Rockies. So he went with young Ignatius to the Rockies for the first time, March 1840. So these are the two journeys I, I, most, I most focus on, 1840 and 1841, because those are the ones that were, you actually went through our area here. So maybe they're, maybe they're a little closer to home for us. So 1840, right, March. It's a journey, he said, fraught with many dangers, but God, in whom I put my trust, I hope, I will, I hope, guide me for it is for his greater glory that I undertake it. The salvation of the whole nation is at stake. Pray for me, and have little Charles pray especially for me every day. Talion es regnum celorum. Their innocence makes them friends of God, right? No need to translate because we're Catholics, you know your Latin. So this is a letter that he sent to his brother Charles, uh, encouraging him to have his son pray, right? Because talion es regnum celorum, right? Thus it is the little thing, little ones, are for the kingdom of heaven, right? So they're the ones that will be listened to God, have the children pray. If the church isn't dying, if, if the church isn't crying, it's dying, right? So that's a very necessary need of having children in our church because they're the ones that will pray for us when we are dying and when we most need their prayers. So then they journey west, and when you read his letters, it's it's, it's fascinating because he's, he's um, also quite a bit of an anthropologist, really, I'd say, because He's documenting every tribe he goes through, their customs, especially their, their burial customs. They're always very well, well documented because they're pretty extreme sometimes about the things they do, like putting him on his horse and driving his horse off the cliff and drowning them both in the river. That was one that the Kansan Indians did, and um, all the women have to cut themselves up and go to the graves at least three years afterwards and do the same thing over and over again, wailing and, and crying for the dead. Um, some very interesting burial practices, that's the most thing he talked about. Eating dog, you know, so it wasn't so bad, I guess, the boiled dog, he said. Um, and when he's on this trip, so he's by himself with a few, with the one guy, young Ignatius, and he's with some the American Fur Trapper Association that's going out there company. And also one other man, whom he came to find about halfway down the journey, he has a fellow compatriot, another Belgian, the Flemish Jean-Baptiste de Velder, who remained his guide for the rest of that year. And it, they said, he says in his letters that um, he was resolved to spend the remainder of his life then serving God, helping the missionaries and anyone he could in getting out to the Rocky Mountains to bring the faith. So that, that was his, his, his great companion in the 1840 journey, um, Jean-Baptiste de Velder, a former, a, a, also a Belgian. So they get to the Green River, they meet the Flathead there, then they go to Jackson, over the Tetons, to Pierre's Hole, that is the Griggs, and there's a big rendezvous happening there, and it sounds like they were, they were there quite a while, and he's doing tons of baptisms, teaching the faith at all times. 
um, kind of gets a, a custom that he would do is he would teach the children, say he'd take, there's seven parts of the Our Father, so he'd take seven children, put them in a circle, one child remembers a part, and they keep going around the circle until they have it memorized, and they keep doing it, and then other people memorize it because the children have got it memorized, and they keep saying this over and over again, so they learn the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Creed, and things like that by these methods. And a lot of his students, um, the set wasn't a real linguist like other ones, but as soon as they could learn the faith and everything's translated so they could teach the basic prayers to them as well in both the faith and in also the, the, the language that they hear those prayers in in the Holy Mass at Latin, in Latin. Um, so then, let's see, go down the line here. Uh, so the famous Saint Father Henry just talked about that, right? So I think he did anyway, I was busy. Um, but uh, I assume he did. I tried to do this one day, it was too windy on, on Lake Henry. It was too cold and windy. It was actually September 8th, 2019. But um, uh, but yes, so the Lake Henry, they went there afterwards, as well noted. He climbed, it says in his letters, he climbed up the divide to the very highest mountain. He got about 5,000 feet and there was too much snow, he couldn't go any further. And he looked across one side into what is now the Centennial Valley, also known as Mosquito Lake or Red Lake, I think as we call it now. And then the other side, looking into Idaho side on, on, on Lake Henry, and seeing the two sources of uh, the, the source of the Missouri um, going all the way out to the Mississippi, and then the source of the Snake going out all the way out to the Pacific, and looking across those two places, and just looking across all of what he's covered, and praying for his fellow missionaries, those in Council Bluffs, those who are out there, and those who are in formation, all these the missionaries across the whole U.S. that they that he knew working at that time. And they said he got to the, he got to the, um, it says go to page 228, two, 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 so I'm going to look down. Yeah. Henry's Lake. Oh yeah, so have you ever driven across Interstate 15, you might recognize what he's seen. So in the, mount, in the valleys and the defiles which we traversed, several more mountains drew our attention. Some were in the form of cones, rising to the height of 7,000 feet at an angle of 45 to 50 degrees, very smooth and covered with fair verdure. Others represented domes, others were red as well-burned brick and still borne the imprints of some great convulsion of nature. There were scoria and lava so porous that they floated on water, and they were found scattered in all directions, and so abundantly in some places that they seem to have filled whole valleys. In several places, the openings of ancient craters were still to be distinguished. The agrilaceous and volcanic strata of the mountains are generally horizontal, but in several places they hang perpendicularly, or else they are curved or wavy. Often one might take them for artificial works. And then we got to our camp on the 22nd of July, 1840, Henry's Lake, one of the principal sources of the Columbia River. And it's about 10 miles in circumference, right? We're climbing a horseback mountain that parts of the water, two great rivers, the Missouri, we went up to the Hill. Two lakes are scarce eight miles apart, talking about Red Lake and Henry's Lake. I started for the sun of the high mountain for better examination of the fountains that give birth to these two great rivers. I saw them falling in cascades from an immense height, hurling themselves with uproar from rock to rock. Even at their source, they formed already two mighty torrents, scarcely more than 100 spaces apart. I was bound to get to the top. After six wearisome hours, I found myself exhausted, maybe climbed up to about 5,000 feet, past snowdrifts more than 20 feet deep, and still the mountain top was a great height above me. I therefore saw myself compelled to give up my plan, and I found a place to sit down. The fathers of the company who are in the missionary service, I found a place to sit down. Um, thanks, Mississippi. Blah, blah. I wept for joy at the happy memories that were aroused in my heart as I looked across the land. I thank God that he had deigned to favor the labors of his servants scattered over the vast vineyard, imploring at the same time the divine grace for all the nations of Oregon, and in particular for the Flatheads and the Ponderays, who so recently and so heartily ranged themselves under the banner of Jesus Christ. I graved upon a soft stone this inscription in large letters, Sanctus Ignatius Patronus Montum, Die Julii, Ben, ben Gisene Tertia, 1840. I didn't say actually, so 1840. So, 
Yeah, Saint, Saint Ignatius, the patron of this mountain, July 23rd, 1840. I said a mass of thanksgiving at the foot of this mountain, surrounded by my savages, who in tone chanted the praise of God and installed myself in the land in the name of our holy founder. Let us implore his and a his aid that through his intercession of heaven, this immense desert, which offers such great hopes, may speedily be filled with worthy and unwearying laborers. Today is the accepted time to preach the gospel in these different nations. The apostles of Protestantism are beginning to crowd in and pick out the best places. And soon the cupidity and the avarice of civilized men will make the same inroads here as in the, the East. And the abominable influence of the vices of the frontier will interpose the same barrier to the introduction of the gospel, which all the savages seem to have great desire to know, and which they will follow with fidelity like the flatheads and the ponderings. Uh, so you need a little, uh, you're just really going to see, he's seen a lot of wasteland that we have out here, and then Henry's Lake on top of the mountain, inscribing that little message on the rock. So you need, if you could ever find his little scribing there on the rock, probably not, because he said he did it on soft stones, I'm sure it's all gone now. Uh, but nevertheless, he did it later next year on the Rocky Mountains, right before he crossed the divide as well. So there it is, going, then they took him up to the area of about Missoula or so, uh, where the Clark River and the uh, Bitterroot River coincide. Um, that's where kind of their main, their summer hunting lands were. And spent there some time, baptizing more, and quickly went back to St. Louis before the snows came. So the second journey, 1842, probably my favorite one, 1841, sorry. Um, he had uh, go back and beg money, right? Because he has to make money to do these things, to bring more missionaries with him. So he gets about $5,000 from the good ladies in New Orleans, and he got together himself St. Nicholas Point, and uh, Father Nicholas Point, sorry, and Father Mengarini, and some other brothers joined the large caravan. And the same route again, going through all the same Indian places. As they go along, they baptize the little children, the old men, and they reach the Green River where they see the site of the Rockies. And he writes this beautiful poem to the Rocky Mountains, which is on page 122. Oh no, it is no shadow vein that greets my sight, yon lofty chain, that pierces the eternal blue, the Rocky Mountains appear in view. I've seen the spots of golden snow glistening like gems above their brow, and over yon giant peak now streams the golden light of day's first beams. All hell, majestic rock, the home where many a wonder yet shall come, where God himself from his own heart shall health and peace and joy impart. Father and God, how far above all human thought thy wondrous love, how strange the paths by which thy hand would lead the tribes of this bleak land from darkness, crime, and misery, to live and reign and bliss with thee. A nice little poem there, written a nice English pro poem for us to read. Um, right, so he gets the Rockies. So this time, he actually comes into my territory, the Bear River. Um, and he talks about going through the Bear River, the Bear River River, and the Soda Springs, and the Port Neuf River, and coming to Fort Hall, page 300. Oh yeah, fun. This is fun here. I like this. So the the you know the brothers, they're they're pretty skilled. Like they're carpenters, they're painters, they're they're artists, and they're they're builders, blacksmiths. But uh, when you're on the wagon trains on the Oregon Trail, right, you got to do everything. So our good brothers, especially, who had had to become teamsters from necessity, much more than from desire, because their their teamsters actually all left them. They didn't want to go that far. Um, how often were they not astonished at finding themselves one upon one upon the croup, that is, one another upon the neck, or another among the hooves of their mules, and they couldn't stay on their seats, without any clear idea of how they had come there, but thanking the God of the traveler that they had gotten off so easily. The same protection cut the horsemen. In the course of the journey, Father Magrini had six tumbles, Father Point quite as many. Once while riding a full gallop, my horse fell, I flew over his head, and not one of us in these various occurrences received the latest, the least scratch. And so that's one of the things to know about all missionaries, especially the Jesuits. They, they were very good at documenting every single thing. Um, and because that's, they send it back, and then it's all written up and put into the libraries so that this stuff can be around yet today. 
Um, so we, we, met, we traveled in this manner, pretty rough manner, to reach the Bear River, which flows through a wide and beautiful valley surrounded by lofty mountains and often intersected by inaccessible rocks. We continued our march through it during eight successive days. The river resemble, resembles in its course the form of a horseshoe. It follows in the Great Salt Lake, which is about 300 miles in circumference, and has no communication with the sea. To note that, so Father uh, DeSmith, when he goes back, right before this, I believe, or after this, he actually encounters uh, someone that we might know, a man named Brigham Young, who asks him, well, tell me about that place out there, because I have like, you know, 5,000 people I want to bring over there. And uh, there's a place somewhere south of uh, Fort Hall, and uh, they call Utah. And he says, oh yes, Utah, yeah, very verdant land, and the cache, and, and those valleys down there. And so then he tells him where to go. Um, on our way, we met several families. Okay, so he talks about different Indians there, um, the Shoshone Indians and the Snake Indians. Some places on Bear River exhibit great natural curiosities. A square plain of a few acres is extent in extent presents an even surface of fuller's earth, a pure whiteness like that of marble and resembling a field covered with dazzling snow. Situated near this plain are a great many springs different in size and temperature. Several of them have slight taste of soda and the temperature of these is cold. The others are of milk warm temperature and must be wholesome. Perhaps they are not inferior to the celebrated waters of the spa or the lime springs in Belgium. I am inclined to believe so, though I'm not firm in opinion. At all events, they are surrounded by the mountains over which our wagons found it so difficult to pass. I therefore invite neither sick nor sound to test them. In the same locality, there is a remarkable spring which has made itself a little mound of mixed stony and sulfurous substance in the shape of an inverted kettle. It is only a small opening at the top, though, through which one can hardly pass. Pass his hand, and from this hole issue alternately a jet of water and a gush of steam. The earth for some distance around resounds like an immense vault, and is apt to frighten the solitary traveler as he passes along. So a great reflection on the various soda springs that were out there, and the other people on Oregon Trail, not Father DeSmet, but they, they said that the water tasted like beer, so. <laughs> so they left the Bear River, and on the 14th of August, our wagons having proceeded 10 hours without intermission, arrived at the outlet of a defile which seemed to us the end of the world. On our right and our left, were frightful mountains, in our rear a road which we were by no means tempted to retrace, in front a passage through which rushed a torrent, but so small that the torrent itself seemed with difficulty to force its way. Our beasts of burden were for the first time exhausted, murmurs arose against the captain who, however, was imperturbable, and he never shrank from difficulty to advance, and advance to reconnoiter as he never at the ground. In a few moments he made us a sign to approach, one hour after we had surmounted every obstacle, for we had traversed the highest chain of the Rocky Mountains, and were near in sight of Fort Hall. So, technically it's probably not the highest chain of the Rocky Mountains, but uh, it didn't look so good to them anyway. Um, now we have Fish Creek Fat, Fish Creek Grade, so that's way easy. Um, anyway, so, he, so then eventually he wants to go ahead, he gets lost, and it gets dark, and they have to camp off in the night, because they don't know where they're at. And then he gets to where he sees the, um, um, all right, early the next morning we descended by a small cleft in the rocks which the obscurity of the night had concealed and arrived on the plain watered by the Portneuf, one of the tributaries of the Snake River. We trotted or galloped over 50, mile, 50 miles in the course of the day. The whole way presented as evident remains of volcanic eruptions. Piles and veins of lava were visible in all directions, and the rocks bore marks of having been in a state of fusion. The river in its whole length exhibits a succession of beaver ponds emptying into each other by a narrow opening in each dike thus forming a fall of between 33 and 6 feet. All these dikes are of stone, evidently the work of the water. The trappers call them the work of the beaver, and of the same character and substance as the stalactites found in caverns. Late that evening, they couldn't quite make them for high camp again, pulled in the next morning to a cloud of mosquitoes. Uh, but then there, Fort Hall, August 15th, 1841, the Feast of Our Lady of the Assumption, they celebrated Mass. So you can say he went through Soda Springs probably August 13th or so. That's what I claim. Anyway, 
So we're going to have dismet days on August 27th, a few days after that this year. So we fast forward here, right, then he goes up. Oh, that's cool too, but we run out of time. Yeah. Yeah. You can buy the book and read it. But, um, Ford Hall, he talks about, he sees the three Tetons on the right and the three Buttes on the left, right? Same things we see every time we drive north. Um, he gets back to the mission and he really notes how unique it is that the faith is still strong. He's been gone like eight months and it's, it's stronger than it was when he left. And within three months of being in the mission, it basically determined they've converted all the Flathead Indians and many others who kept coming over the mountains from the Ponderays and the Coeur and the Nespers to hear about the faith as well. It's fun to note that uh, in the next, that fall in 1842, he goes to um, Fort in Spokane, where they call that Fort, forgot already. Um, it's my next page. Nope, I didn't type that. It's my written page. Anyway, he gets there and gets to the Cowspell Indians, and uh, they already know the art. They already know the sign of the cross, and they know all these things already. And they said, "Well, how do you know this?" Well, we we sent our smartest guy down down to, down to St. Mary's Mission in the Bitterroots, and he learned everything from you guys and brought it back to us already. So they already had their own apostles coming to them. They already had their own missions from their own people, uh, who are learning the faith very quickly. That so everybody can learn the faith together. Um, like when they talk about um, communion, or, or first start, we got to start with confession, you know, confession first, right? So they baptize them, and then once they're, once they're learned in the faith, then they'll, then they'll, do the, they'll give them Holy Communion. So they do confession first, and all of one of well, we gotta do that out in public. If it's gonna be any good, we gotta say this out loud, right? That's very true, right? Sometimes, uh, I think confession's bad enough by yourself, well, talk about doing it out loud, man, that's, that's gonna be a very good way to show penance. Um, Holy Communion, he says, are you guys sure you believe this is Jesus? Yes, we believe truly and sincerely that this is the Lord. And so then, as this is probably something where we have most, most to engage. Well, how do we bring the faith to the Indian people? And are they actually capable of receiving this faith? And what is the best way to teach the faith to these Indian people? So we go here. So the Jesuits have been doing missions for years already at this point, and Father DeSmith actually is using the Paraguay mission as an exemplar mission for the Flathead, the Flathead mission. And the one they simply did in Paraguay, that is in South America. So the plan of evangelization adopted by these intrepid apostles merits more than a passing mention. We find it outlined in a letter that Father DeSmith wrote to his superior, Father Verhagen. He quote, the little nation of the Flatheads appears to us to be a chosen people out of which a model tribe can be made. They will be the kernel of a Christianity that even Paraguay could not surpass in fervor. We have greater resources for obtaining such results than had the Spanish fathers. Remoteness from corruption, a remoteness from corrupt influences, that is their language in the white people. The Indians' aversion to other sects, that is they don't like the Protestants. His horror of idolatry, as um, uh, they were fairly much more of a monotheistic type of religion. His liking for the white man, his, his liking for the white man, liking so they're open to, to listen to them, and for the black robe in particular, whose name for him is synonymous with goodness, learning, and piety. The central position of the mission, sufficient land for several sentiments, fertile soil, the protection of high mountains, no meddlesome and petty authority conflicting with that of God and those who are, represent him upon earth, no tribute to pay, but our prayers. Such are the advantages of our, that our mission enjoys, right? So they picked a good spot in the Bitterroot Valley. They had a lot of land they can cultivate eventually, and they did cultivate it eventually. And they, they talk about it, that you know, they have probably seeds, and they're like, well, don't, don't put them in the ground, they're gonna die, we want, we want to eat those things. And so then they had to wait until the spring to see them rise, and how, how fascinating the cultivation of grain was. Um, uh, so, Father Smith was of the opinion that they could not do better than any other model they had. So, this is what they laid down. First, with regard to God, a simple, form, a simple, firm, lively faith in the practices and precepts of religion, a profound respect for the only truly religion and all that relates to it. So, very, this is the basic principle for their love of God is the basic parts of the religion, right? Going through the creed, learning the basic facts of what, what their faith is and what Christianity is and who is Jesus and what is the power of the cross. And then also a tender devotion and respect for the Virgin Mary and the saints, a desire of conversion of others, 
fortitude in trials and sufferings. So the first mission was named after St. Mary um, because they did the, the mass was um, a dedication of the, the, the church building was Our Lady of the Rosary. But also it, there was um, uh, later on, a few years later, a, uh, I think it was a young boy received visions of Mary even. And, and so that was a special thing in, among, among that community as their devotion to our Blessed Mother Mary. And desire of conversion of others, right? To spread that faith. Uh, because they're, they're still a semi-nomadic nomadic people. And so they go off and, and do their, their hunting and come back again. And so this, this idea of having um, them sharing the faith with their fellow Indians that they go hunting with as they hunted with all the Indians from the other side of the Rockies as well. And so the sharing of the faith. And fortitude and trials and suffering, right? Because the Flathead Indians were very peaceful and somewhat not nomadic, but the Blackfeet were just right next door and they were not peaceful. And the Sioux were just down the line and they were definitely not peaceful. And so they, they still faced great struggles um, in, in the missionary efforts. With regard, regard to one's neighbor, respect for authority, for the aged, respect for parents, justice, charity, and generosity to all men. Father Dismith speaks a lot about um, various other tribes who just basically stick the old people out in the desert and light the house on fire because they don't want to take care of them anymore, right? And so, and then also the exposure of babies was very common, or even giving their babies, selling their babies to the French, the French trappers, so they can get something in return out of that. And so there's a sense of it, it took a lot of, a lot of, yeah. You know, Father Smith says the Flatheads were very moral, a very moral people, other than they had a very a great desire for gambling. Uh, that was the, their biggest vice. They didn't have any other vices but gambling, like games of chance, to the point where they would offer their own lives in, at, at, um, in the pot, and they had become slaves along with all their, 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 their wives and their children as well, become slaves because they lost the game. So that was probably their biggest um, vice, because they weren't a warlike people. They weren't sanguine stuff, the other folks around. Um, so they were more open to that. And as a note, um, and then with regard to oneself, humility, modesty, discretion, gentleness, pure living, and the love of work. But to attain this ideal, the Indians would have to be kept away from all bad influences. He says, here in this place, we are far removed from the corruption of the times and from all that the gospel implies in the term, the world. A great advantage we must safeguard by the strict surveillance over all intercourse between Indians and white men, extending our watchfulness even to the workmen we employ. And so that's something that they're gonna face later on is because uh, you'll see, we know about the Mullen, uh, Mullen, Idaho, right? And the silver mines. Right, so the Mullen Trail is created eventually from Captain Mullen. He makes this trail, and that's bringing in a lot of people into the North Idaho region to take advantage of the, of the gold mines. And then, of course, all the like, Silver City in Montana and stuff like that became very populated in the 1850s and 60s. And so they had a, a very change of lifestyle. And so the question is like, like so um, what did, does the Smith think he's actually doing any good in this? Because it's very difficult to bring the faith to a people that will eventually change. I think there's a, there's a sense of there's this appropriation of, of different cultures and this growth. And we point out that these certain tribes were more able to receive that than other tribes. Later on in his life, DeSmith spent multiple times going to the Sioux when he was forced to, when he was based out of St. Louis later on. He never could start a mission to the Sioux people. He had a good relationship with them and went there, but he could never start a permanent settlement with them. And he came to realize that this is, this is a, a extra challenging thing to bring this mission to the Sioux people, and not like how easy it was with the Flatheads, and how he recognized the blessing it was that these Indians were able to receive the gospel so well, and wanted to receive the gospel so well, such that it still is uh, the majority of the Flathead Indians are Catholics still today, along with the Coeur d'Alene Indians, because they had missions there the whole time. The longest enduring one would be the Coeur d'Alene Mission. This man never built it. He assigned people to go there. Uh, other famous people like Father Ravali and Father Josette, they were the famous uh, Coeur d'Alene Catalba Mission people. But, um, so it's something to realize. What is the faith that the Indians had? And this man, uh, writes on writes on that. Uh, I don't have it in the book because they left out that chapter. But I listened to it on the audio. And he speaks about them as, as, so they have this recognizing, it's a very monotheistic faith, which is unique, because you wouldn't think that, um, maybe from a rudimentary understanding of indigenous cultures, we think of maybe like the Aztecs, you have know, the god of the sun, and the god of the moon, the god of that, and the god of this. 
But the, the, particularly the, the, the Northwest and the inland Northwest Indians were very monotheistic. They believed in the, the one great spirit, is how they would, how it would be translated. And this great spirit is, is, is the Almighty, the creator of everything. All gifts come from him. And you have to do certain things. And if you don't do good things, if, you're, if you have bad works, well, then you won't get up into that joy with the great spirit because there's the, 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 the spirit of evil that tries to catch man and pull them away and, and pull them away from, from serving the good and the great spirit. So the sense of you can see that there's definitely some monotheism there, but also what we might be called dualism, kind of this competition between good and evil. And they're kind of equal gods. And but every tribe would have a little different flavor of how that might have ran, how that might have come about. And some of the other ones that you see other tribes find you find more superstition and things of that sort, where maybe the god is the, the sun is a god, or they have this stuffed bird that they, they bring out and you worship this bird and things of that sort. But the, particularly these, these, these inland Northwest tribes were very much, uh, their faith was very monotheistic, which makes them very much able to receive the gospel even quicker without a lot of re-understanding and, and re-education and, and, and um, the Western philosophy that makes us so easy to understand our faith. So it's a very, very beautiful way to reflect on that, their type of, what is the faith they have? And as I, as I read through his letters and his time, and other, other missionary work, like the first missionaries to Oregon, like uh, uh, Archbishop Lanchette, and, and what's his name, Demur, um, they came over in 1838. Um, they also had the similar experience of bringing the faith to those indigenous tribes. And they were very, very receptive of Christianity, very receptive of this understanding of one God. And you can see as you, as you under, read through it and the responses of the Indian peoples, they, you hear more and more, not just Great Spirit, but now the Creator, the Almighty, the All-Loving. And so this great reception of a better understanding of who is God, a deeper understanding of who is God. And something to consider this with more recently, and the so-called synod they had in the Amazon. I keep using this word synod, I don't think we know what it means. Um, but uh, they had the synod in the Amazon, and in the working document with this, they said they went so far to say as well, maybe these people don't have original sin and they don't have the need of the gospel. They don't have a need of baptism. Is this something we believe? That's a very big question. If that's the case, then all of this missionary work is unnecessary if the indigenous people who don't have a re reception of Christianity don't need Christianity. And these are current leaders of the church that are saying, well, maybe they don't need Christianity at all because they're pure and innocent already and they love the earth so well. Uh, and so that's something we really have to engage with. This is a, a very counter to Christianity, this sense of a noble savage, and they're just fine than where they are. And in fact, they're probably better than we are because they take care of the water and the trees. So it's something that, so this is a big engagement because this is what people see. When they see the statue of the Smith in St. Louis University in 2015, they saw a European white male throwing the cross at native Indians. But if you understand who Dismet was and his passion for bringing these people not just into faith, but bringing them into stability so that as the other nations come in, they don't get kicked out by the Sioux anymore, and then also so they don't get kicked out by the miners anymore, but that they're able to live um, their life and live the gospel fully and completely, maybe in their own special way. I see that very much when I was in the Pueblo Indians last week. They have the Adobe Church, and right next door is the Kiva. And people say, well, why do they want their Kiva next to the church? Because the Kiva is where they do their, their indigenous type of um, religious things. Um, I said, well, because it's not what it was before. The church is the, hot, the most important place. But they can still keep part of their culture that they do in their native language. No one can learn that language. Not even the priest can. He'll get kicked out. Um, but they, they understand what is Christianity, and they understand... The, the, the language of the people that, are, that they live in now. And so there's this better com combining of those cultures together. So it's a very, you can see maybe a beautiful fruit that comes out of that. And so I, that's why I said, well, the Amazon needs Jesus and there's nothing we can do. We can't not bring the Amazon Jesus. We can't, we could not have not brought Jesus 
to the people of the Rocky Mountains and bring them into that faith. And so the, the next question we had to deal with, well, do we have to throw out all the statues of this man? Right? Do I have to take down my statue in my backyard that a few people look at every once in a while? I don't think so. Um, not at all, right? I'm not, I'm not about anything about canceling the rich culture and the rich history of our faith. And you come to know who he is, you realize that he was Samson. He was mighty. He was strong. And not only did he love Jesus and bring Jesus to many people, but he really knew who what he was doing. He knew the people that he lived with. And as, as he says, when he was asked to become a bishop for the second time, he says, oh, my heart's with the Indians. Never mind, I'm not going to dare be a bishop. The third time, sorry, my heart's with the Indians. He was even the first time in the presence of Gregory the 16th. He says, well, I want to make you a bishop. Sorry, Pope, that's not happening. My heart is with the Indians and serving and bringing the gospel to all the nations. So anyway, he died in 1837, 1873. A lot of stuff happened between that. Um, a lot of trips, seven times to Europe, like six different times out to the Rocky Mountains. Um, but uh, he ended up dying in St. Louis at the university where he ended up being uh, the, the procurator and kind of one of the administrators there in St. Louis. So there he is, Father DeSmet, right? So if you want to, um, you may make a pilgrimage like Father Henry did, go up to Henry's Lake. Oh, Father Henry at Henry's Lake, that was pretty cool. <laughs> Um, climb the mountain. Don't want to try to climb yet. That's my goal yet. This time I'm going to do that. Maybe in July I'll get up there and see if I can find that inscribing. Or the other one that he put on the, the Continental Divide at Short Pass. Um, he put one there too. So there it is. Father DeSmith, pray for us and help us not give up spreading our faith.